This is probably the best advice I can give you in this entire video, okay? Set it and forget it. So far, most of the videos I've done on here about the BMP CC OG have discussed using the camera in a very stripped down way. After all, the OG really was designed to live up to his name as a pocket camera, and there's a lot of draw to using it to get very high quality footage in a very low impact way. But what if you bought this camera with the purpose of doing something more, like a long form, full production project, such as a short film, documentary, or even a feature narrative. After all, the cinema part of this camera's name also implies its intended use for quality cinema style shoots. And the raw manual control nature of the camera means that it should fill the bill as far as using it as a cinema camera. So today I'm gonna to look beyond the physical size of this little guy and talk about using the BMPCC OG for cinema style work on a feature film. After all, I did shoot my second feature entirely on this camera with great results. So to help you do the same, I'll go over what you can expect when using this camera on a feature, what its strengths and weaknesses are when compared to something like a RED, ARRI, or other Blackmagic design camera, as well as what you need to add to it when rigging it out to help you do your best work when shooting a long form lockdown production with the BMPCC OG. Now be forewarned, this is a pretty long video. There's a lot to cover, but I promise you there's a lot of good stuff here to help you out when using this camera, as well as feature filmmaking in general. Now obviously the first thing a lot of people wanna know, and probably why most of you clicked on this video to begin with, is the BMPCC OG good enough to actually shoot a feature? Now sure, you can get as existential and meta about this as you want and say that it's all about story and the best camera is the one that you have, but if we're really gonna boil it down to brass tacks, the thing you're wanting to know is this. Will my movie look like a real movie if I shoot it on this camera? Now the short answer is yes. Now does that mean it will look good on your phone, on the TV, in a movie theater? Again, the answer is all of the above. And I know this because like I said, I shot my second feature on this camera. And while that movie did have some issues, one of the best things about it, according to most, was how it actually looked, the cinematography. And that movie did have a very limited release theatrically in the region of Germany where it was filmed. And guess what? The image still held up when projected on an 80 foot screen. Now, does the fact that the camera doesn't shoot in 4K hurt you in any way? No, HD is more than enough. Even if you wanna go theatrical, most theaters still only have 2K projectors and require a 2K DCP for delivery. And even if you happen to slam dunk this thing and do need a 4K delivery, the image can always be up -rest. Now I filmed my second feature in 2016 and at that point the OG was only about three years old and Blackmagic still sold it new. It wasn't legacy at that point and was considered a contemporary camera. However, I had shot my first film on RED and to be honest, the four and 5K did save my button post because I didn't shoot enough coverage and I had to crop in several times to fake coverage in the edit. So with that in mind, why did I even choose the OG to begin with when I already had a history using RED? Well, first and foremost, I knew I would be filming Heritage in a much more stripped down gorilla fashion, micro crew. On a good day, I had about seven people total and on small days, it was just myself and the actors. I would be filming in some very remote locations some potentially dangerous locations and in some very public locations where I didn't have the budget to clear the set. And while you could and should build up this camera for larger feature work like this, and we'll go over that in a minute, I knew that I would also need access to this camera and its image quality in a very stripped down form, something that isn't as easy to accomplish with a RED or other cinema cameras at the time. The second reason I chose this camera, my first film had a lot of revisions and reshoots. And if you're renting a camera, you won't have the luxury of just keeping it on hand for when you need to grab it and shoot some pickups. I learned that lesson hard, so I was determined to have a camera that I could just grab whenever and take with me wherever in the event that I had to shoot something for the film. And believe it or not, in the edit, there were times I would just get it from the computer, grab the camera, shoot a quick insert, and plug it straight into the timeline. And some of those shots ended up in the final film. Now it's 2022, don't all these things apply to the 4K or the 6K or back in 2016, the A7S or 5D? Sure, also high-end quality portable cameras, which leads me to the third reason why I chose this camera, the look. Now, if you're watching this, it's probably because you know, argue as some may, 
that the OG and the 2.5K as well have an extremely unique look that is not to be found anywhere else. And to have such inexpensive access to that look in 2016 and even today for well under a thousand bucks was and is a big deal. Now let's address some of the concerns that may be out there with regards to this camera. First, probably being the super 16 millimeter size sensor. Does that small of a sensor negatively impact the cinematic image of the overall film? After all, it makes it more difficult to get a shallow depth of field, etc. Well, again, check out this video from a couple years ago about what goes into crafting a cinematic image. You'll find that shallow depth of field is actually very low on that list. General depth, which is created through framing, set design, lighting, does more to create a cinematic image than depth of field. And if you pay a bit more attention to some of your favorite movies, I think you'll come to realize that shallow depth of field isn't even implemented that often. After all, if you just spent thousands building up a set and lighting it, why would you wanna blur it all out? Along with that, Super 16 is far from a non-cinematic frame size. It's based on Super 16 millimeter size film after all, which believe it or not, has been used in Hollywood and high-end television for decades and is still used fairly often today. Films like Hurt Locker, The Wrestler, Walking Dead. Honestly, there's nothing non-cinematic about Super 16 whatsoever. And what about that crop factor and overall lens availability? Another concern a lot of people have. Yes, the Super 16 sensor of the pocket does have a 2.88 crop factor when compared to a full frame. How do you get lens sizes you need for this camera, including wide angles, if you are challenged with that crop factor? Well, fortunately, this is an even easier problem to solve today than it was back when this camera was released in 2013 because the micro four thirds market has grown so much in the last 10 years. Now, I recommend starting with 12, 16, and 25 millimeter. If you need to get wider or longer than a nine millimeter and 35 millimeter will essentially complete your package. But even just the 12, 16, and 25 will get you the three most common lengths needed for basic film coverage, your wide, your medium, and your close up. And best of all, you can get all three of those in high quality cinema form housing for under 800 bucks. Now a bit more on that as well as cine versus still lenses when I go over the gear that's needed to rig this out, so just save those questions for a little later. So clearly the sensor size is not an issue, but is it sharp enough in HD and bright enough in low light? Well again, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, HD is more than enough to craft cinematic images expected for a feature. And believe it or not, proper lighting and good glass will have a tremendous impact on the sharpness of your image. After all, a garbage lens on a red will likely look worse than a great lens on the OG, I promise you that. So take some time to find your proper exposure, either naturally or build it out with lights, and you'll be hard pressed to tell the difference in image quality between this sensor and one from a camera that costs 20 times as much. Good glass, good exposure makes all the difference. Now, speaking of exposure, how is the OG in low light? After all, it is limited to a 1600 ISO, and we live in a world with cameras that have a 16 million ISO. Short answer, it's fine. I believe that dark should be dark, black should be black. And this scene here was literally lit with flashlights because our lamp bulbs broke on the way to set. Is it grainy? Yes, but can you see the actors and the elements that matter? Yes. And using the dark areas of the frame to sculpt your depth and not trying to see everything in the room lets this image be a believable nighttime scene as one's eyes would expect to see it. Now I will say this though, the image will fall apart if you're trying to make the camera see in the dark. Proper exposure does not mean everything is exposed. Light what you can, but again, let the dark areas of the frame stay dark, crush the blacks a bit, and you will be successful in having a pleasing image in low light environments. Another thing to remember if you're still mad about the 1600 ISO limit, if we were again to compare this to a film camera and everyone seems to want that film look, Kodak doesn't even sell a film stock above 500 ASA. 500. And finally, moiré and aliasing. Now, moiré refers to a strange color pattern that appears on certain textures, often found in clothing fabrics and on the patterns of rooftops of buildings. Aliasing is a glitchy sort of distortion that's found in fine horizontal lines, such as telephone wires. Now, both are present with this camera, though neither are that bad, and both are largely fixable in post. Before Heritage was distributed, it had to go through a quality control check by the transcoder. Now, they did find a few frames where both were present, 
and I was able to fix them fairly easily and resolve with a softening mask and tracking the areas in the frame that had the issue. Now, I won't go into depth on how to fix that in this video, but maybe in the future we'll go over it. The point is, it was a 90 minute film with only about four or five minor issues of Moray, which were easily fixed. So I think that says something about whether or not this is a deal breaker with this camera. All right, so we've established that from an image producing standpoint, the BMP CC OG is good enough to create images needed for a feature and have it look like a quote, real movie. But how do you actually use it in that capacity? What is needed both externally and internally with the settings to help you capture that incredible image? So let's build it out a bit. The first thing you're gonna need is a cage. Now this can be a bit tricky this day and age. No one makes them new for the old pockets anymore, but they do exist in the used marketplace. And I'm sure if you Google enough, someone is probably 3D printing them as well. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the purpose of a cage is not to protect the camera. The purpose of a cage is to add mounting points to the body so you can build out and add accessories. So even one like this little guy from Wind Camera, which is actually my preferred cage, which seems to leave most of the camera body exposed, is more than enough for what we're doing. You don't need a cage that completely encases the camera, but honestly, this day and age, take what you can find. Now, one thing, if possible, try and get a cage with cable locks to protect the side ports. These are extremely fragile and one wrong tug can permanently damage the camera. Now, the next thing you're gonna need is a set of 15 millimeter rods and a way to attach the cage to the rods. Now, fortunately, these are universal and easy to find. Really, the only part of this build that is OG specific is the cage. Now, once you have the camera mounted to the rails, we're gonna need a battery solution. The OG is known for poor internal battery. Honestly, you need a solution for any real use of this camera, but for a feature shoot, it's especially important. I highly recommend a V-mount system. Now they can be a little bit pricey, but well worth the investment. And apart from powering the camera, which one strong battery could probably get you through a full day, you can also use one of these DTAP splitters to power other things like your monitor, EVF, wireless follow focus if you have one. Basically, it becomes a power source for all your needs and frees you up from having to constantly monitor and change batteries all over your rig. Now, it mounts to your rails and is quick and easy to swap. Two batteries will probably, again, get you through the full day if you're putting accessories on it, but consider getting three if you know you're gonna be on location and might not be able to charge batteries on set. Now, when shouldering the camera, the batteries also help add a bit of balance and stability. Apart from just the V-mount batteries, you're going to need a cheese plate, rail mounts, and battery plate to get it powered and on your rig. If your battery has a built-in D-tap like this one here, you could forego the battery plate and opt for a quick release plate instead, but I prefer the battery connecting plate. Now for powering the camera itself off the D-tap, you may find it difficult to track down the BMPCC OG D-tap specific cable. However, the normal 12 volt DC D-tap cables that are cheap and available new also works. Simply add a coupler to one of these as well as the basic mini DC cables that are used for the pocket, which you can still buy brand new on Amazon for about 50 15 bucks, get these and you're all set. Next is a set of hand grips. Now, if you plan to never ever shoot handheld, you can skip these, but I would advise grabbing them just in case. When rigged out like this, you'll be surprised just how stable the shots become for handheld shoulder mounted work and these little handles will make things even easier to control. Now, next is a top handle, preferably one with more mounting points since adding the top handle itself often restricts access to the other mounting points that are on top of the cage. Now, the purpose of a top handle, while it can be used to help get some hip shots and stuff like that, lower angles. It's more for movement of the camera on set. It gives you a safe place to grab the camera with a solid grip when handing it off or mounting it, leveling it on a tripod, changing lenses, and so on. So it's definitely needed and helps keep the camera safe. Next is the follow focus. Really just about anyone will work, but obviously the more expensive the model, the better the quality. Now quality comes into play with precision and eliminating things like backlash or the looseness of the gears, meaning that too much backlash allows for extra play in the wheel before it actually starts to engage the focus ring of the lens. Now I believe that a follow focus is 100% needed. When filming, the goal is to keep your hands as far away from the camera body and lens as possible to avoid any unwanted shake of the image. Now, if you think you can just grab the lens with your hand to pull focus, you'll find that the exerted energy on the lens will result in a shaky image when shifting focus. Now, a follow focus will eliminate that while also giving you a lot more precision in your focusing. Now, if your lenses aren't geared for a follow focus, you can buy a gear ring for them, either a universal adjustable one or ones that are specifically made for your lens size diameter. Both Tilta and Small Rig make these. They're only about 10 bucks a pop. I highly recommend getting these and putting these on your camera if it's not already geared for follow focus. 
Next, you're gonna to wanna to monitor, and of course, the cables that are needed to get the image from the camera, which is a micro HDMI to HDMI with this camera. Now the monitor is very much needed since the screen on the BMP CCOG, while it works for basic reference and framing, does leave something to be desired in terms of brightness and clarity. Also with the larger battery in place, there's a good chance that the camera screen on the back is completely blocked from view. Now there are a lot of options out there, shop around for what works best for you and your budget, but there's really no need to get super fancy here. Even one of these little cheap ones from Futka are good enough to get the job done. And of course, a little mini magic arm will get it mounted onto the rig for you. Now this next one is totally optional. Some may see it as overkill, but an EVF can also be very useful if you're shooting a lot of handheld. Now I came from a news cameraman background. I really like having an EVF, but a monitor will work just as well. The advantage of the EVF is added stability when shooting handheld, it sort of creates a third point of contact. And it's also a lot easier to see on a sunny day because it blocks light and reflections. And it can also help you focus more on the image capture by blocking out other peripheral distractions. Actions. Now, if you're flying solo, you can use just the EVF or the monitor, but if you have someone helping you assist on the camera pulling focus for you, it's nice to have both on the rig so that you aren't overcrowding one image source. Now, again, totally optional, but some of the older models like this Alphatron can be had for pretty cheap on eBay. I actually grabbed this one for about 50 bucks. Now, of course, you also need a way to mount it. You can either get a full EVF mount or a lightweight magic arm like this one will also do the job. Now, before we talk about lenses, you should also consider grabbing a map box. The purpose of the map box is it allows you to add filters to your rig via these little trays that slide in and out. Now, these will hold ND filters, polarizers, which are used to cut glare and reflection, or a gradient filter, which are great if you want to keep your sky from blowing out within your frame, but you still need full exposure on your foreground. It sort of darkens the sky while keeping your foreground uh, clean and clear. Now, map boxes also help flag off the light from your lens. So if you have a light source off to the side, sort of at an angle of your lens, be it the sun up above or a lamp off to the side, oftentimes the light can kind of spill in and milk out your image. Now when this happens, you lose a lot of contrast and clarity and a map box and those French flags on the side will help prevent that. Now while map boxes are great and you can get cheap ones out there, if you're really in a pinch, then screw on filters and a lens hood will also work. Finally, let's talk about lenses. Do you really need cinema style lenses? No. Stills lenses, which 80% of the lens market is lenses originally designed for stills cameras, will work and do offer a very nice image. However, there are a lot of disadvantages to stills lenses and a lot of advantages to cinema lenses. And if you can afford cinema glass, which for this camera you can because cinema glass is impressively cheap, it's definitely worth the price of admission. Now the problem with a lot of stills lenses is they don't lend themselves to consistency. Oftentimes, newer stills lenses don't have hard stops on the focus and the focus ring itself has a very short travel distance which means it's harder to fine tune or nail your focus without going too far. And if it's a focus by wire system, then they aren't even consistent with how far the focus ring travels between your focus points. Now another issue is image uniformity. With stills lenses, it's very common for each lens to have a slightly different color tint and contrast level from lens to lens. Now, this is even more true if you're mixing Canon with Sigma and so on, but even within one brand, a Canon 24 millimeter can look very different from the Canon 50 millimeter. Now, obviously because we're shooting raw, that's fixable in post, but it definitely creates a lot more work on the back end. Also, f-stops are often different from lens to lens. Now, you may have heard about f-stops and t-stops and wondered what the difference is. The main difference and the part that concerns you is that t-stops are universally consistent. A t2.8 on one lens is the same as a t2.8 on another. The same amount of light is let in and this isn't often the case with f-stops. An f2.8 on one lens could be wildly different from an f2.8 on another. Now, a lot of this can be solved by just shooting the whole film on one fixed aperture zoom lens, but then you need to be sure that you have the reach you need to get all your coverage. And even then, there's almost always some amount of light reduction when a still zoom lens is zoomed all the way in, fixed aperture or not. 
Now, all these issues I just mentioned with stills lenses are solved with cinema glass. The focus and aperture rings are mechanical with longer throws and hard stops, so it's easier to nail your focus. The light is constant across the T-stops, and as long as you stay in the same family, the color tint and contrast also remains the same across all lenses. A final perk is that they're often also uniform in size, so that when you change lenses, you aren't having to also adjust your follow focus or map box location on your rails. Everything lines up from lens to lens, which helps you move faster on set. They also always have gears for follow focus units. Now again, Cinema Primes are actually very affordable in the micro four thirds market. I've spoken a lot about the old Vedra lenses, but also the Miki lenses are very high quality and inexpensive, especially used. Often you can find them on eBay for under 300 bucks each, and they have every size you need to get full coverage. Of everything I've mentioned so far, the Cinema lenses will probably serve you best in using this camera on a feature. All right, if you're still here, I appreciate your patience. Let's talk now about actually shooting and what you need to do with this camera to get the images that are expected for a cinematic feature. First, the settings. Always shoot raw, especially for a feature. There's a lot of variables, a lot can happen. And while you should try to nail things in camera on the day of, you do want to be sure that you still have options in post to fix any mistakes or surprises, primarily with color balance and exposure. Now, all of that is flexible when you shoot raw. I would say this, always give yourself that option. Now, Movie Making 101, shoot 24 frames a second or 23.976, pretty much the same thing, but I do prefer the latter, and use a 180 degree shutter. For my viewers in Europe, 25 frames a second if you want, but after spending some time in the commercial world over there, I did come to find that you can still shoot 24 frames a second for an arguably more cinematic look and deliver a 25 frames per second packaged file so that you're still good as far as frequencies are concerned with monitors and projector. Now, also for my European viewers, as well as anyone planning to shoot in Europe, you actually will need to use a 178.2 degree shutter setting because the electricity flows at a different frequency. And if you use 180 degrees, you will see light banding on your surfaces if you have artificial light. I learned this the hard way. Even if you don't see it on your monitor, double check via false color. And if it is present, you will see it pulsing in the image. So US, 180 degrees, no matter what. EU 178.2 unless it is just natural light, then 180 degrees works just as well. Now 800 is the native ISO on the camera, however, you will get a much cleaner image at 400. It's all raw, it can be changed later, but if you use 400 and expose at that level, the image will appear sharper and cleaner. Sure, you can argue that you do lose a pinch of dynamic range, but I think it's worth the trade-off for a cleaner image if you have enough light to do it. Now the first and most crucial rule is this, never change your settings. Keep consistency. This is a long form project shot over the span of several months and images that were shot two months apart are often then set side by side in the final edit and you need them to match. Now obviously your color temperature will change based on your settings, inside, outside, cloudy day, etc. But that is again adjustable later if need be via the raw workflow. Also you should only ever change your ISO if you've exhausted all other resources as far as getting more light onto the sensor and never ever change it within the same scene or setting. Worst case, it can be bumped up a little bit in post, but try to nail it in camera and keep it locked within a set scene. Now the no adjustment rule isn't only applicable to your settings, it also applies to your lens. Pick a stop, ideally at least one stop closed from wide open since most lenses are at their softest when fully wide open, and leave it there. Again, if you absolutely need one more stop of light in a dark scene, you can make the change, but understand you're costing yourself a little bit of sharpness and consistency. Almost all of Heritage was shot at a T2.8. There were a few exceptions where I took it to a 2.2, but 2.8 was the set aperture. Constant aperture again means that all your setups match with equal exposure within the same scene and your depth of field, sharpness, everything is the same so that when you're cutting back and forth in the edit between bits of coverage, the image itself doesn't change between the cuts. Now, another advantage to not ever changing your settings is again, months later, if you're in the edit and you need to grab an insert or reshoot a piece of coverage, you will 100% know with certainty what your settings need to be in order to match those other shots. What I'm getting at is this. There's a certain expectation within an image of a film, mainly consistency. 
and you need that. And to achieve it, you have to leave your camera and lens settings alone. Control your exposure with filters and supplemental lighting adjustments. If the image is too bright, don't start changing shutter angle, ISO, or stopping down the lens. You add ND filters first, and then look into maybe cutting or blocking some of your light. If this is all you do, you will be 90% successful in making your footage look like a real movie. This is probably the best advice I can give you in this entire video, okay? Set it and forget it. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is proxying your footage to make your edits more manageable. RAW obviously uses a lot of data, plan on having a lot of hard drives. They're cheap now, which is great, wasn't always the case, especially when this camera first came out. But always have at least one backup, and to make things more manageable, create and edit the film off of proxies. Now your editor and your computer will thank you. Check out this video here for more tips on doing that. I highly recommend it, and it will allow you to keep the entire project on one drive until it comes time to make the final export and reapply the raw footage. All right, now there's a million more things I'm sure I could talk about with regards to shooting a feature, lessons learned and whatnot, but these are the things that are BMPCC OG specific if you decide you wanna use this camera to shoot a feature. Now the coolest thing about the workflow and especially the additional gear that's needed is that everything you buy to rig this out with the exception of the cage can be used on other Blackmagic systems. So 2.5K, Pocket 4K, the micro, it's all applicable and really nothing is wasted. Now, if all of that is just too much, too much gear, more than you can afford, can you still get away shooting a feature with this camera stripped down? Absolutely. In fact, like I said at the beginning of this video, a perk of this camera is that it can be used stripped down, and there were several times I used it that way, nothing but a battery and a cheap lens to get the movie shot. Don't let anything I've said here stop you from creating or using whatever you have to get your project done. Completion and follow through are more important than just about anything else when it comes to filmmaking. So with that, I hope this was helpful. I hope you feel inspired. This is a great camera, an amazing tool, and an outstanding low budget option that anyone can learn to use and an affordable enough one for anyone to own. The only limit here should be your imagination. If you have any other questions about filmmaking or shooting a feature, please check out some of my other videos or drop me a line in the comments below. Be sure to hit like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.